Well, okay, it's probably time to press the button and get going and say hello and good evening and welcome to tonight's One Dublin, One Book event. Uh, I'm absolutely thrilled to be part of the One Dublin, One Book event uh, series this year. I'm glad to have gotten in early as well because there's so many things happening over the course uh, of the next few weeks as part of One Dublin, One Book, and I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. Thanks for joining us. My name is Rick O'Shea. I'm the presenter of the book show on RTE Radio One, amongst a few other hats that I have. Um, Joining me tonight are two authors, uh, one of whom is the author of the One Dublin One book this year. And we decided that to make this event a little interesting, we would bring along uh, an author who brought contrast to that. And that's why tonight's event is called Naughty and Nice. Um, if you'd like to drop us a comment, please do so. You know where to do that, uh, either if you're watching in the Ricochet Book Club live now or if you're watching on YouTube as well. Um, I kind of want to get cracking in this, and I'm not going to make a big deal out of the intros. First of all, uh, joining me, one of Ireland's most prominent and nicest in the real world crime writers, Alex Barkley, and the writer of Leonard and Hungry Paul, Ronan Hessian. Hello to both of you. Hello. Hi, everybody. And, and, and fantastically, we've had this conversation because we spoke just a bit before this all went out. Our cameras are all working. We can all hear each other. So something is bound to go hideously wrong at some point over the next while. So just forgive us for it pretty much. Um, can I uh, ask just really very briefly, um, as I, I, I kind of do it at the beginning of all of these events, just for both of you, how things have been for you over the course of the last kind of few weeks and months. Run on you and I have talked about this in a, in a couple of other locations, but maybe maybe remind people as well. And Alex, you and I haven't really talked about this uh, at all. So maybe Ronan, we'll, we'll start with, with you and just uh, uh, have a little bit of a chat with us about, about the last few weeks and months. Well, yeah, I think last year, I sort of managed to spend about nine months saying, this is all very different, different, isn't it? You know, we can indulge ourselves. So I think I, you know, I had to take a different approach in January. I think I ate all my 2021 treats in 2020 uh, mm -hmm. and I left all my 2020 exercise to 2021. So I've had a very different kind of opening few months. I've been, you know, talking about nasty versus nice. I'm even nicer than the last time because I, I'm behaving myself, I'm exercising and, I, and I'm eating better and so on. So I'm a real goody two shoes these days. So yeah, I've just been trying to get out. I, I live near the sea, so really just to enjoy that, enjoy the sea air. Uh, and I think there's some signs, I think, you know, certainly with the sort of older people in our family who are a bit more vulnerable, starting to get vaccinated now, a few little glimmers of hope. So I, I'm feeling good about things at the moment. It's been, it's been a long year. I, I think certainly my the way I've been treating this over the course of the last while is probably radically different to yours, Ronan. I've, I've, I'm still continuing to eat everything probably for the last five years or so. There's no sign of that stopping and I'm just going to run with it for now. Alex, how are you? And, and tell me a little bit better how you've been. I'm eating all the food as well and loving every bit of it. No guilt at all. Um, I was thinking of like a huge amount of reading that I've been doing or like the back of pizza boxes, even though I know the directions by now. Um, so a bit of that, right? In, enjoying that side of things like, you know, comfort food and comfort things to do and kind of taking it easy um, and as much as I can while working away too. So I have a tendency to just keep working and working and not taking breaks the way I should. So I've been good at doing that. And like Ronan, I live near the sea. So that is huge, I think, uh, you know, to give you that sense of space and and freedom. It's a huge difference to be able to just stand there and, and look out at that vast space. And I do feel very, very lucky, you know, to have that. So, yes, yeah, so it's been working and, uh, you know, could be a bit better on the exercise front. The walking I've taken up um, a lot more and it's kind of, I suppose, more sort of essential than it would have been before. So, yes, it's very, very strange times and just trying to adapt. You know, I think every lockdown has been kind of different. Um, so, yeah, this is probably a, a healthier one, you know, and then, yeah, get some more exercise in. I, I have two thoughts on this, one of which is I haven't actually stood in front of the sea for I think about nine months now because it's just outside of my 5k. I can I can get as far as Trinity College in Dublin as the edge of my 5k so I can't get any closer to the sea than, than that. But my only suggestion is if you do want to maybe do a little bit more walking, dogs. Got two dogs about eight months ago. We've walked 5k every day since because we have no choice in the matter. It's great. Um, I it's a really good way, yeah. 
I want to ask both of you just before we get started uh, on all of this, because in in looking up a little bit about both of your backgrounds, you're both Northsiders, and you're both you both grew up in and around in the same couple of years, probably only a few miles away from each other. Is, is there any crossover in that? Is there any like? You, you, do you, did you guys have any sense that the other one had come from there? Did you do the same things? I know that's a very broad question. Well, first of all, I thought that Ronan was way younger. So I only saw in an interview um, uh, that you're like a year younger than me. So I had lobbed another sort of six off you. So I was like, what? So yeah, 10 out of 10 for that anyway. But yeah, no, I, I certainly um, was surprised to know that as well, that we were like nearby. So yeah, no, we haven't come across each other. I know I'm, I'm I, suggesting that the north side is like a village there. I know that's terrible. It's like people from outside of Ireland go, everybody knows everybody else. You know, I think if you were to run a poll in the chat over who looks younger, I wouldn't fancy my chances in, in that in that result. <laughs> no way. Um, I think I know. Yeah, yeah I, I lived in Baldoyle for about fourteen years. I know you grew up around Bayside. I think. Alex, you went so to school in Baldoyle. Yeah. So I, 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 we before we moved out here a few years ago, that's that's where we sort of lived. So, um, we probably, I don't know, we probably queued in the same chipper at some stage, or oh, definitely looked at the same sea. There's a theme here, you know. <laughs> Um, tell me about, uh, about both of you uh, um, getting published for the first time because they were quite quite different avenues. Ronan, I've seen you say uh, recently that you said it's quite strange for being best known for something that you only really started doing in 2017. So maybe for both of you, just tell us a little bit about, about your, your avenues into ultimately getting published. Maybe Ronan, you'll, you'll start first. Well, for me, with Leonard and Hungry Paul was sort of the first sort of prose that I'd written. I'd written music and sort of songs before. And that was really, you didn't even start out as, you know, with the intention of writing a novel. And I never had an ambition to be a writer. You know, it was never something that I aspired to. So when I sat down to write it, it was just a question of seeing how far the sort of characters and the stories would take me. Uh, and once I got underway, you sort of get the sort of sense with the novel. Nobody can stop you writing a novel. That's one of the interesting things about it. There's no, there's no, really, there's no infrastructure you need. You know, when I played music, it's kind of hard to do without a drummer. You know, unless you know how a mixing board works, you do need some basic support. Whereas writing is very free that way. So um, when I when I finished it, I, I didn't have any expectation around publication. Uh, I sort of thought it was not really going to fit in the sort of uh, you know elevator pitch world of publishing. And uh, but then I found Blue Moose. You know, a, a, a small publisher in the north of England. I, I loved the books they published, and they were the first ones I sent it to, and. Uh, they were within a matter of, of a week or so. It was all, all the nasty business was done, uh, and we just got on to the business of, of doing a book. So, uh, but yeah, it is strange, you know, to be as Alex has a young-looking forty-five, and um, you know, when I was forty-two, everything I'm doing now, what, what, nothing I'm doing now was in the picture when I was forty-two. So it is quite strange. It's a bit, it's a bit of a reincarnation. And, and Alex, I, I hate to say that it's been, I think, if I have my numbers right, 16 years since Dark House. Is that right? Yeah, does that so. feel long? Yes, actually, well, it does. It's really weird. It feels um, only like yesterday and then it feels really long as well. And it's interesting what Rona was saying about, you know, uh, being 42. I think, you know, when I started, I, I was... I think I would have maybe enjoyed the opening part of it a bit better when I was older. It was so startlingly um, intimidating, I suppose. It was just, again, it was quite quick. And going over to London, meeting two different publishers, trying to choose between the two. I mean, it was really, really, uh, it was an extraordinary experience. It was great and a wonderful memory. But I, I suppose I wasn't really settled into it because it was a bit like being plucked out of somewhere into a completely different world. And and like Ronan, you, you know, you don't know, you're just writing, you, you're very free. And I had no ideas, no expectations uh, in terms of the outcome at all. And just thought, I remember thinking I would love a dishwasher. I do remember that bit. Um, and I thought, OK, just if I could get a dishwasher, that would be great. So that worked out and that was lovely. Um, but yeah, it was it was not at all what I expected, I think. Um, it, it happened quite quickly. And when you're in such isolation with it, um, I had a very close group who were um, reading my stuff as I went. And that was it. I hadn't a clue how it was going to be received after that. So yeah, it was it was an adventure. 
why start writing that sort of fiction in the first place? Because we're here tonight to talk about uh, nasty and nice. And and ultimately, you took one path, certainly in that part of your, your career, where there's an awful lot of nasty people there. Where, where, why, do you, why was that the road you started down? Yeah, it's funny because I think of the write what you know thing and I'm always a bit, you know, on that front, that was what I what I knew in terms of what I read. So I was a really voracious reader of American crime fiction at the time in particular, like since I was about 14. So it was logical on that front and I loved the, the landscape and I loved, loved the nastiness. And, you know, it is a bit like, you know, you don't know that you're going to be able to write such nasty characters. It's kind of slightly alarming when you start because my uh, character in that, Duke Rawlins, is vile. I mean, there's no other way to describe him. I write him and I love writing him. I always have. But it is just like, what is going on here? So it started focused on the on the detective, Joe Lucchese. So it started with that and then Duke. So it was the two together and then went from there. So that was where my knowledge lay. And I, I was working as a journalist in fashion and beauty, which I loved, absolutely loved. And I could have done something in that area. And, you know, I might do something in that area again. But yeah, it was crime that that drew me at the start. But I, I like switching it up. So, you know, I'll, I'll probably always do that if I'm allowed. I, it's interesting in that uh, you talk about taking those that kind of inspiration from the from the stuff that you you loved reading. Ronan, I wonder about you because we've talked before, particularly about your love for fiction in translation. And it was only when I was having a conversation with somebody uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, uh, we had a conversation where it was like, yeah, the, the, the characters in Leonard and Hungry Paul, and in Penenka as well, which is, is the new book that's coming out this year. There is something slightly Japanese about them. And I mean that in the best possible way in that you and I do read a fair amount of Japanese fiction in, in translation. And a lot of novels are, are set in similar worlds with characters who are quite normal, quite human, quite gentle. They are decent people. There aren't enormous amounts of, of shock that occur to these characters within their lives. It, did that in any way influence who Leonard and Hungry Paul became? It's really interesting. I hadn't thought about the direct influence uh, that way. Uh, I think I think you could be right there. I think what strikes me about Japanese literature in particular is the absence of cynicism. Uh, I think in, a, in American writing, I don't know, Alex, you, you, you read a lot of American writers. I don't know whether that's something that strikes you about American writing. There isn't a sense of a view of the world uh, as you know, the, the, the observer is slightly pursing their lips at it. Uh, and I think in, in Japanese literature, I think there's a long tradition of, like we talk about autofiction as a, as a sort of relatively recent concept, but a Japanese I know we're going right back to the beginning of the 20th century of people being quite open, uh, of declaring a lot in their, in their books. Uh, and I think, I think you're right, there's also aspects of the Japanese aesthetic around resolution and conflict. And even structurally, I wasn't really aware of it until after I'd done Leonard Hungry Paul, but there's a there's a particular in, in the West we're very familiar with, I think, the narrative arc. You know, the idea that something takes yeah. off, there's a conflict that drives it and then a resolution. There are alternative structures in Japanese, and one of them is, is one called Kisho Tenketsu, which is basically a, a, a form of narrative that doesn't involve, it involves setting out two parallel streams, which are resolved at the end, but not but through a sort of revelation or it's not so much resolution it's more a sense of enrichment at the end and um, they, they relate to each other in unexpected ways so i think some of that is in there i, I don't i don't read in a sort of structural way i don't take notes or, or anything like that but i sort of i'm sort of like a big pot and these are just sort of seasonings that i kind of throw onto my own brain uh, and over time they just have an effect and it's interesting you say that about the japanese influence it, it wouldn't surprise me because i'm very drawn to that What's really interesting is I, I was just about to, to, to go on to something else, but you and I spoke on, on the book show on Radio 1 at the weekend, and you mentioned that very briefly, and I didn't really have time to, to, to go back to it. But you don't really keep notes, do you? you? You don't have notebooks. You don't jot stuff away. You just keep it all here, and it all just kind of percolates that way. For a lot of authors, and I can see Alex looking at the screen already going, I, I, that's that's not necessarily the conventional way of of creating character and and plot and novels. 
No, but but then I, I couldn't write the kind of books, Alex, like Alex books that are more complex from a plot point of view, there's more characters, there's more you have to get consistency in and whereas mine are sort of sort of dreamy, you know, they can kind of go. So the the reason why I think it works that I don't use notes, it's a bit like telling a joke, you know, you, you sort of know how to tell the joke. So I could I could more or less before I started, maybe not so much with Leonard and Henry Paul, but certainly with Penenka, I could have sat you down and talked you through the book before I ever wrote it. Uh, and I wouldn't have necessarily been a sequence of events, but I would have had feelings in mind or particular impacts in mind. Um, so in that sense, I kind of think it's there. And then when I sit down to write it, it's just a spontaneity. You know, I feel if it's too planned, then it, I'm in execution mode. I'm just a question of delivering it. Whereas if I'm actually trying to make it happen in real time, I'm in a different space. I'm in my imagination and there's just a different set of brain waves. There's just this different the whole feel to that world. And that's where I can write from. So that, that's part of the reason it's not, although it is a bit like, you know, I often say it's, it's a bit like stretching for exercise. You can get away without planning. You pay for it later though. So, you know, so, you know, likewise, when I go for my run, sometimes I skive off the stretching and I'd rather be sore later. So sometimes there are things I have to fix. Um, but I, it's really, it's not that I'm, you know, uh, Willy Wonka or something, I can just kind of pull this stuff out of anywhere. It's that I just want to be in that space and anything too structured or if I'm working for something not in that space, it just knocks me out of it. So I prefer just to, to sort of be in a bath and just my imagination. Would I be right to suggest, Alex, that that's not the way you work? Well, funny you should say, I, I completely agree with everything um, that you said, Ronan, because I've done them all a different way. And this was my epiphany this week that I have written probably every book in a slightly different way. And it's really joyful to do it the way you've just described, which is just sit down and let it come out. I, it's a totally different um, experience. And uh, the book that's coming out next, the YA novel, My Heart and Other Breakables is diary format. And it was just, um, exactly that right just get up and off I went and there was no structure at all and there was a, and the diary format is brilliant right there is a form of structure there but creatively imaginatively no you just you know you just wrote and it was it was beautiful the thing with notes um I, I feel like what you were saying there as well about feeling restricted in any way I think outlines do that for me um I like writing them I like the style of them but being really rooted to them that I find like leaves me with less it, it is a bit like oh it feels like the story is told now and you have to get out of that mindset and what I do with that then is you know make changes to it as I go which again I'm I'm lucky that I'm allowed to do that but yeah I, I write notes often it is to get ideas out of me more than anything because they tend to build up and it's a bit like just needing to release them so the result of that is just having an epic amount of notes around the place and an epic amount of, of notebooks. But I write on A3 um, paper and a massive A3 clipboard, and I have a little one as well now, an A4. But it's 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 just chaos. If I showed you uh, the other room that I write in, there's loads of stuff everywhere at the moment. And actually, that can be visually annoying. So then I'll I'll go and work at a desk that has nothing on it. So yeah, I'm I'm with you because I've done it that way as well, and and yeah, it's a lovely approach too. But I do have to have some sense of structure in the crime novels. Just to, there's a sense of needing to, at a point, get your ducks in a row and be able to see on a on one document where these clues are being revealed and where your big you know moments are, um, so that it's it's all kind of you know paced nicely. But I I would still write freely and then maybe rein myself in after that. G given that the title of this uh, One Dublin One Book event is, is Nice and Nasty, I want to talk to both of you for a while about character and about actual character creation. Ronan, you once said that Leonard and Hungry Paul was about human nature. I, I might think that maybe Alex might say exactly the same thing about some of the characters that she's created across time. And I'm interested to know how both of you would would reach that point. Tell me maybe, Alex, maybe I'll start with you about character creation initially and, and where they come from. Well, it's, for me, it's, a, again, varies between um, 
different things that I do, but usually what I find is they can arrive, when I say fully formed, it feels like they're fully formed and I'm just getting to know them as if they're real people. So like if you go to a party and meet somebody and you know get to know them, they become a friend, you gradually find out more. So there's a very organic element to, to it as well, where you sit down, you start to write and more is revealed about the character. Uh, dialogue is a brilliant way of doing that as well. I put them in a conversation and, you know, they start, you know, revealing information. And before I started writing uh, fiction, I just thought that was nonsense, that there was that sort of, it sounded made up that other authors said that because it sounded, you know, interesting or sounded, you know, I don't even know what I thought it sounded like, but definitely a bit mad until I did it. And I think the one thing that is the most important for me is that sense of giving them the room to breathe. And I think, you know, that's important because if I'm trying to um, put any form on them or try to try to have a character behave a certain way, it just doesn't work and they don't feel real to me. So I obviously I will have a sense of, you know, what I want to happen. So say with the Wren series, which features an, an FBI agent, uh, she's a central character, she's a recurring character. So I go with those characters and her colleagues, they're there already, and then I need to come up with a bad guy. But often what I will have there is an idea of what I want to include in the plot, what kind of crime it is. And then you bring in the, the bad guy and have some interactions there and, and build him up, but also, with crime it's very important what's very important with bad guys anywhere even if they're a form of bad guy in a different type of book is how they work with your central character so they they have to be in there pushing their buttons just by their very existence to create this constant effect of of interaction you know between them that you know you're getting to see the drama because of these pings off each other and so you're you're really crafting something that's going to work across a whole novel and keep creating drama and uh, I've been uh, teaching uh, writing and I was saying to uh, to the wonderful people uh, I was teaching the more you know your character the more gifts you're giving yourself in in terms of story and and drama so it's very important to have all the elements there but also to allow them to evolve that you know as as you write them into the story and now i'm interested how this this plays with ronan because y y your characters obviously ping off each other in a completely different way so maybe talk to us a little bit about that but maybe just just begin by where do Leonard and Hungry Paul come from and you can talk a bit about Penenka as well if you like as well because despite the fact that I was I was warned off a very long time ago it's a very different book the people in Penenka and the characters are just as beautiful and just as wonderful as the characters in Leonard and Hungry Paul so there is a there is a kind of worldview there to those so wh where where do they originate from? Uh, well first of all thank you but uh, uh, I, I think that the characters do sort of come to me you know they they, they are not one thing I would say, and I think it's often misunderstood about writing, is there's maybe an assumption that characters are a projection of the author, that they come, that they're an extension of the personality, um, and therefore can, can only come within the experience of the author. Uh, the, your, your imagination runs deeper than your personality. I often think it's a bit like, like if a person owns their house, and maybe they own 10 metres into the house, or 20 metres, or however far oil goes. They own that far, but they don't all own the land all the way down to the Earth's core. There's, there's a level of depth where ownership and identity cease of any relevance, and your imagination is, is at that depth. So there are flashes, and I don't know whether these are me and my past lives. I don't know whether they're fragments of people I've met, but they have, they're full of people. It almost feels like I'm a Russian doll. You twist me a bit, and out pops Penenke. You twist him, and out pops Hungry Paul, and maybe my writing career is limited by the number of those smaller dolls inside me, but they, they very much come to me. And what happens, it's an, it's an interesting process in a book where what begins is I have a sense of who they are, and that's kind of temporary, and that becomes how I try and convey them. And then after a while, they start to sort of come through themselves, they speak for themselves. 
So it's, it's almost like an analogy. You know, when you make paper mache masks, where basically you blow up a balloon, make a lot of wet newspaper around it, and then you burst the balloon. And you take that out, and what you're left with is the mask. So it's, I start off, I make the balloon. And then at some stage, I burst the balloon and take it out. And then I'm trying to see, you know, what is the character? And it's, you know, you get these interesting conversations with your editor. And my editor is called Lynn Webb, where, where Lynn will say, I don't think Marie Therese would say that. Or, did I, I, you know, I have a feeling she's waiting to say something here and you're not telling her what to say. So you almost start interpreting for the characters. So you're no longer designing them and executing them. You're actually, they have now left you and you're now their interpreter. And I also have the sense that if I met them afterwards, sort of backstage after the book, they'd come back and say, why did you make me say all that stupid stuff for like, why, why did you, I, I do, he was, you know, I, I had a chance to win that argument. You know, you never gave me the lines. So uh, it, it, that balance shifts and you hear writers often talk about characters taking a life of their own. And that, that is a really interesting experience as a writer to, to actually observe as a point where you're going, okay, this character is real and, and I'm actually trusted to land this character from here. Up to now with my own creation, I could make them do what I was, but now I actually, this is the dangerous part of the book where I could actually screw them up. I, I wonder how many authors have had that moment of terror where they're in the middle of a dream and realize they've met one of their own characters who then reprimands them about something that they made them do within a book. I'm sure it's universal. I'm sure it's happened, happened everywhere. And um, when both of you are, are developing characters, how important is something like, let's say, physicality, for instance, and physical descriptions? Is it, is it important at all or not so? Alex? Mm, that's a really good question. I've never been asked that question before. Um, it can be. It's yeah. It features again differently in different characters. Um, it's never something that I focus on in real life with people, though. So it's not at the forefront for me. I think if I was to think of the first thing that I would nail in terms of a character would be how they speak. I would think that their the dialogue and and their like verbal tics and their you know the personality that comes out that way probably comes uh probably comes first um but descriptions are never my uh thing that i go with i'm because i think that i always see people for the essence of who the person is and and not for the rest of them i think that's how i am with with the characters as well and with some of them i find myself right away and then kind of deciding what they're what they're like unless they come in uh, with their personality, with a look as well. I will usually have somebody who's very, has a very particular uh, look that comes to the fore straight away. And they're a real, they're a real focal character for me as I'm writing, but the other stuff I, I write in. Um, yeah, and I do the, I actually do the same thing with, with uh, describing the surroundings as well. It's a sort of working into the whole thing, you know, but yeah, I, I, I have them in my head then and that's who they are forever. Um, and I still think that they exist when I'm not writing them as well. Like I still think Ren is out there, you know, getting hammered in a bar and getting in trouble in work while I'm quietly writing a different book, you know. And how, how about you, Ronan? How, how important or unimportant is, is physical description when it comes to characters? It, and the characters for me, when I'm writing them, they're a bit like, you know, the characters in a dream where you have a presence, but they don't have the definition. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and certainly they seldom have faces, that's for sure. I might have a sense of their general colouring, maybe, or, you know, their, their, their physical presence, but not, not really... Uh, a sense of detail, and there isn't a huge amount of physical description in Leonard and Homie Paul, uh, and some sparing description in, in Penenka. Uh, and I think I think one of the reasons for that is I think I'm always conscious of, or maybe I'm unconsciously doing it, of what information I'm giving the reader. And if I want the reader to give the person a chance, I just know how physical descriptions is a physical descriptions are really you know clear shortcut to understanding somebody. If I said this tall, gorgeous guy walked into a room with brown eyes and, you know, you, you know, like a kind of younger version of me or whatever, people would immediately place them by reference to the other characters. And I like the idea that the characters get to speak for themselves a bit first and prove themselves a bit first. So, so I tend not to put too much uh, physical description in. It is, it is something 
that you know I often think about when it comes to when I first started writing. It's so much easier if you're if you're writing if you're on TV or a play or something because everyone looks different. You can tell who the characters are because one's a man, one's a woman, one's got a hat, one's uh, has a beard. So you, you don't get confused as to who's who. Whereas mm -hmm. in books, you can get confused. So you know you don't have those physical cues. So it, it's something I wrestle with about whether you need some other signifier for characters when you don't have those physical descriptions. But the physical descriptions don't carry. You say someone has red hair and you don't say, oh, and he walked into the room, by the way, remember, he's red hair. And, you know, he brushed his red hair. Got us, he's red hair, okay? Don't yeah. forget, the guy with red hair is this guy. You know, you can't really do that. Um, I, it's really interesting that, that you, you say it because I, you know I'm, I'm aware that you, that you don't necessarily write a huge amount of that detail about your characters, but in my own head, I have a very strong sense of who both Leonard and, and Hungry Paul are and a lot of the characters around them as well. Tell me a bit about the importance of smaller characters in, in books and, and what they bring to the story as a whole and how important they are to both of you. Maybe Roland, you'll just take that one. Oh, I think they're hugely important. And I think that's something that TV taught me. You know, you look at a, a show like Frasier, say, uh, or, or, or any sort of great recurring uh, series, and those smaller characters really build out the world. Uh, and I think paying attention to them, I, I really like, um, you know, you know Richard Scarry? You ever, as a kid, these are, these are, you know, kids' books where, they have a picture of a town and there's lots of detail going in or a picture of a beach and there might be like 200 characters on the page you might have a guy getting sand kicked in his face someone else stealing an ice cream you know someone else who's drowning and your eye is just drawn all around and i think that's so important i think it is very it, it does depend on which point of view you're using so if you have a, a first person narrator or a third person narrator but an att attention to the smaller characters. And Hungry, Leonard Hungry Paul has quite a few smaller characters. Like, you know, you have Barbara in the hospital, there's Mrs. Hawthorne, there's the manager in the supermarket, you've got the guy in the Chamber of Commerce, you've got the guy who, who ran the mine association, you've got the guy who worked for the guy who ran the mine association, you've got the guy from the Arts Council who was giving the money to the mine association. So all that just, to me, that's a plausibility thing. You know, you're building a world. Of course, it's going to be populated with lots of minor characters. And in a way, it, it gives the bigger characters a break. You know, they can be in scenes where not everything is high stakes. So they can just have a, so some of the stuff is just chit chat or it's just real world, you know, pacing. And what about you, Alex? What are your thoughts on that? Can I just have a little pause here because I haven't had a chance to just say how much I love Leonard and Hungry Paul. I adore it. I absolutely love this book and every single character in it. And, and what you've just said there, it, I, they were just perfectly crafted, every single one of them, and they all had their role. And it was just, it is just a beautiful book. So I just want to say, yeah. Um, uh, the minor characters are brilliant as well. Absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, minor characters are, are great. I love uh, writing them. They show up to show me uh, or to show the reader uh, something about the, the main characters. And yeah, especially with crime novels, you're guaranteed to have them because you're bringing in, um, you know, in some cases when the victim is, you know, no longer around, uh, that's a minor character on some level. But then you've got whatever you want to include in crime, you know, the the, the family left behind, um, the suspects, you know, other detectives in the squad and they're all there doing their job. But I also love having the little randomers in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, witnesses. And you can have a lot of fun. I always have fun with witnesses, weird, like nosy stalkers and, you know, information. You know, there's so much information to be kind of taken in in a crime novel. So I love those little characters. And some of my favorite characters uh, that I've written and in, in, that I've got attached to in, in my books were, were minor ones. You know, there, there was one that I adored that I, that I killed and I still feel really sad about it. I didn't see it coming <laughs> and I, I hate myself for it. So I had to, I, I read a little bit of it at one point and uh, I got really emotional and I thought, oh God, so yeah, poor, poor minor characters in my ones. So you just don't know what's going to happen to them. <laughs> I have asked both of you to prepare a little something to read to illustrate the both niceness and nastiness of characters that you have written. I'm just not sure which which direction we go in here. I think we might have to start with with the nice and work our way on to the nasty to kind of prep ourselves for. So Ronan, what are you going to read from Leonard and Hungry Paul? 
Uh, I'm going to read a little bit from chapter seven, which is where Hungry Paul is on his postal round. And it's sort of a reflective piece. I think it kind of encapsulates the sort of philosophy behind the novel, I think. Okay. Um, Hungry Paul continued on his rounds, his bag getting lighter and lighter, doing a job that has existed largely unchanged for hundreds of years. To any busy person, burdened with all of life's responsibilities and preoccupations, Hungry Paul's lot would seem a bearable one. He didn't have to decide which of a patient's limbs to amputate first or where to invest the life savings of a company's pensioners. There was no pressure to report fourth quarter losses to the higher ups in HQ or force feed cold carrots to a fevered toddler. His job, on the few days he did it, involved no agonizing decisions or regrets that might spoil the conversation over dinner. And yet, in modern vernacular, postal work is a profession that has become synonymous with violent meltdowns. Why would this happen in such an apparently placid line of work, which involves chatting happily to the householders and performing a task that has, throughout history, been shown to be helpful in all ways? Most overworked middle managers would gladly swap their late evening conference calls with the West Coast for the simplicity of the postal worker, walking in the mixed March sunshine alone with his thoughts. However, such white collar fantasies fail to consider what it is that bends even the most pacific minds towards self-destruction. Though we may be a species that prizes great minds, we are also terrified of and by our thoughts. In prisons, the most extreme and austere punishment that is meted out to errant prisoners, those whose behavior exceeds even the diabolical standards of incarcerated society, is solitary confinement. The awful fate of being imprisoned with only one's thoughts for company. With no distractions, one thought billiards another, and an endless internal monologue drowns out the rest of life, bringing dissonance to silence, restlessness to stillness, and anxiety to forethought. A certain type of person, isolated and unsuited to long daily periods of reflection, will eventually think themselves to madness. But Hungry Paul seemed to be able to maintain his peace where another man might have declared war on themselves and those around him. What did he think about? The answer is, quite simply, nothing. Hungry Paul had been blessed with a mental stillness, which had become his natural state over the years. His mind worked perfectly fine, and he had all the faculties of a healthy, if slightly unorthodox, man of his age. He just had no interest in or capacity for mental chatter. He had no internal narrator. When he saw a dog, he just saw a dog, without his mind adding that it should be on a lead or that its tongue was hanging out like a rasher. When he heard an ambulance siren, he just heard an ambulance siren, without noting its Doppler effect or wondering if it was really emergency or just a driver running late for dinner. And it is in this way that Hungry Paul maintained a natural clarity throughout the day and stayed apart from the trouble that the world will undoubtedly make for those who look for it. This is where we play the audience because there is no real audience. We're going to do that. Congratulations, that's, that's, that is, it's lovely, it's beautiful. Alex, where are you taking us? Oh, my Lord. First of all, I literally have that passage uh, marked in my copy of the book. I absolutely love it. And also there's an element of envy there for the, the quiet mind that doesn't narrate everything, because I'm sure yours is like mine, which is having, a, you know, creating a lot more stories everywhere you look. OK, no joke. I have done this before in the past when I've talked about something and then read something. There's serious uh, physical description in this. <laughs> So, um, but it is a short story. So it's a, a, a little abridged version of a short story from um, Belfast Noir and it's called The Reveler. So um, like I said, it is abridged, but it, it's very hard for me to pick something nasty that's actually speakable on any level. So this is reasonably, reasonably speakable. Um, and all you need to know right now is that the guy I'm talking about is a, has killed somebody and somebody may be onto him. So here goes. 
I don't know which disturbed me more at night when Paddy Gillen became who he really was or in the morning when he became publican beloved. His forum was the bar that bore his name, its blinkered windows on the shore road, its caged door on Dandy Street. Rising up and down from his gaffer taped stool by the till, Paddy Gillen was like horse and rider, his eyes bulging with the telling of his tales, his smile equine driving the story and being driven, blooming to fill his form. But when the punters were gone, the only journey left was up the claustrophobic staircase to bed. As soon as his foot hit the first tread, a narrowing began until the tall story of Paddy Gillen was pared down into the tiny space of his boyhood room, as though the steps were whetstones. Once there, he would stand in front of the cloudy mirror above the sink and begin his ritual. He would slide the false teeth from his mouth, then the rippled hairpiece from his head. He would use the face cloth, then slide the grimy towel out through the metal ring and pat himself dry. There was a lot of sliding with Paddy Gillen, his tongue across his vacant gums, money across the bar, eyes across a woman's body, chips across a plate, until all that was left was a red smear, like the one he slid a man through in the public toilets on Shaftesbury Square. I believe that Paddy Gillen had a deformity of the mind, a small nub of some kind where thoughts would get caught until eventually there was a grotesque knot of slights and grudges that were surely pressing against part of his brain, impairing its function. For years, this squalid little cockpit had helmed his actions, and he was not a bright man, Paddy Gillen, so these trapped thoughts were rarely new. He was a pickpocket of opinions and a mark for those who wanted their message to spread. On Paddy Gillen's thick skin, they could brand their burning convictions, and he wouldn't even feel it and he could pass them on, still ablaze but unnoticed, against the ice cold of a pint glass. How I knew of Paddy Gillen's ritual in his boyhood bedroom is that I had watched it on and off for weeks, on nights when I knew he was alone. I would stand on a breeze block on the porch over the bar behind Gillen's, its red lights shining up to my knees, the rest of me in darkness. I wondered why he never closed his curtains on such a pitiful deconstruction. That last night, I am watching from inside. I am crouched behind a pink curtain under the dressing table behind him, an embarrassing space, unplanned. I am barely breathing, set to watch his display. The tap is running, but he hasn't started yet. The one night I need his routine to consume him, he's in some sweaty holding pattern. I can't move. I hear his teeth come out, the sound like the slap of a child's hand, but then I hear them rattle back in. I don't know what gives me away, but he turns to me. I fire. I didn't want to kill Paddy the publican, the cheery figment, but it's too late. So it's my turn now to carry out his routine and I do it piece by piece, crouch down beside him, conscious of the soles of my shoes. It was Paddy Gillen's ritual and now it is mine, followed with no deference, the teeth, the wig, the face cloth, the towel. I am covered in blood, destroyed. Cheery. That's what we want from our contrast piece tonight. That's exactly oh, what we're brilliant. looking for. Um, before I've gotten actually, there's a couple of questions that have that have uh, come in in comments were, uh, that I'd like to do before um, before we finish up, and I want to ask you both about about what's happening next for, for both of you. But just before I do that, tell me about making an entrance and the importance of introductory scenes when you're introducing a character. Maybe Ronan, start us off on that. Yeah, I really um, try and give a lot of thought to that. I know, I know, with, with Hungry Paul, I really tried. I wanted to make his first appearance in the book sort of special and, and sort of original. Uh, it's not particularly um, spectacular, but when he arrives in, basically he's he's in a a white uh, toweled dressing gown that he thinks looks like a judo gi. I think it's pronounced. Uh, and he's he's trying to dry his hands after coming out. But I wanted a sense of, of an entrance there for him, something that would help people remember him. And I think when I what I'm thinking of, and I think of chapters as scenes, really. You know, I'm always I, I'm always thinking about uh, Claire Keegan, the Irish writer, had a really good expression where she said, "When you're writing, you're making an incision in time." And I'm always thinking about where to put that incision. Where's the right entry point? What's the right camera angle? 
uh, for us to meet this person for the first time. And I want it to be special for the reader. So I want to make sure that there's something about it that just conveys where the character's coming from. And the sort of sense that they had a life before and you just met them, but they existed before you met them. They haven't just been created. And that's, that's I think, the trick around trying to create an entrance and, and how you introduce the character. And what about you, Alex? How do you approach that? Yeah, I agree. I, I adored, by the way, I adored his entrance. I thought it was brilliant. And it's an interesting thing, the, the bathrobe element. I, I think you can, um, it's really important to have something that roots it. And I'd say probably, Ronan, I know that was carefully chosen on one level, but you probably didn't even realize that, you know, someone was going to be reading that and going, oh, it was just so impactful and, and real and had a gorgeous story to go along with it. So I absolutely loved that. And it is incredibly memorable. And, and there is that element, yeah, that you, that it is almost like a cinematic entrance. And there is that sense of, I always think like with directors where it's that, what is in that rectangle and, I often think of that, you know, what is that image I'm I'm giving you? And is it, you know, wide shot, mid shot, close up? And what are you going to get? So for me, I think it's important to introduce somebody in the, you know, to to give you the the style to which you should get accustomed. So with that in mind, I uh, also opened with with Ren uh, in, in Blood Runs Cold uh, in a bathroom scene, um, except she was wrapped around the toilet, not in a very good state after a, a very, very rough night. And that was setting you up to know that though she was about to head to work as an FBI agent, um, she may not always be going in in the in the best shape, and and that is a bit of a, a theme with her. Whether it's always a hangover situation or not, it, certainly there's shabby elements. So I'm like straight in there, going, okay, yeah, no, this is not your very uptight agent who's uh, going to be very following all the procedure. So you get a maverick straight away, and you'll hopefully remember that and 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 expect the worst. Okay, a couple of questions uh, just before we finish up. Uh, hello to Mairead. Mairead says, Alex West Cork is very much part of the setting in I Confess, but Ronan Leonard and Hungry Paul could be set in any city. So how important is location to you both? Okay. Whoever wants to start. I'm going to throw that one to Alex. I'm going to start with you. Okay. Um, yeah, location is important. And um, for different reasons, I suppose I choose uh, different spots. And I, I know um, originally, say, with uh, with Ren, I wanted this wide landscape and an NYPD cop had said to me, uh, people go to Colorado to disappear. So that's how Colorado ended up where Ren was based. West Cork, um, where I live and I'm in love with, I never thought I would set a book here. I was also slightly nervous about doing it and uh, concerned would anyone talk to me uh, after setting such a horrific book there. Thankfully they do, because I would be heartbroken otherwise. So yeah, I wanted something remote and I did want to do something Irish, but I wanted something remote yet still in Ireland. And, and Bera is very much that. If you've never been here, uh, I think it's even a surprise for people that there's somewhere that feels this remote and is, you know, on, on a small island. Um, so, yeah, that, that was very close to my heart. And actually, I've set uh, my heart and other breakables here as well. But that's a, a lovely story. So it's it's very much a love letter to Bera. So it's a, a different style. So, yeah, I think location should always be such, uh, you know, a, a, another, I know everyone hates saying this, but another character in the book, but it, but it is important to create the overall atmosphere and to show your your characters in their best or, or worst light. And, and and Rona, I'm asking you, I suppose, in the context of, again, I've read Penenka as well. And for both of those, you, you have a sense, obviously, of location and of where this is happening. But you're not really sure where that is. Tell me, tell me why you've been kind of deliberately vague about that. Yeah, so, so I think Leonard and Paul is, is located not far from here and now, which, wherever that is for the reader. That's basically where it's supposed to be located. And that's because I suppose the underlying themes are intended to be universal. So we want to dealing with, um, if you were to put, put them in Dublin, uh, Dublin is a very big literary character. Uh, they would have to have a relationship with it. You would have to draw it for them and have to work out their relationship and what the references and connotations were. And I felt that would just draw me away from the very close look I wanted to have 
at Leonard and Hubie Paul and their, their nature and the way they work. I have to strip away a lot of things like, you know, the physical descriptions, the you know, surnames, uh, you know, there are, there are no particular signposts there, no, no real idiomatic language, nothing like that. And that was really to try and foreground something which, if you didn't do that, is continually going to be covered up by more obvious things. But Penenka took a slightly different approach, which is that it's not said anywhere in particular, but there's a much stronger sense of, of a place. Uh, it is very much, I did sort of construct a town for Penenka, a place that he belonged to and that was very, very important in his life uh, and a very important influence on his life. So even though it's not located in a particular place and you could argue wh where, where exactly in Ireland or Europe it is, but the, the main thing was that he had a relationship with a place that meant something to him. So again, it's, you know, it's, it's just for me, what, what I'm continually looking at is human nature that's an applied to people in life and how they make it through life. And so I try to try to I make choices then about what, you know, I often say these, these books are a portrait rather than a landscape, you know, so they're intended to focus on, on the human nature. There. Uh, I have another question for it. I was going to ask this anyway, but let's let uh, the wonderful Jackie Lynham ask this question. It says, I can't wait to read Alex's YA book. Can you ask her when we'll get to read it? Uh, I am, I'm going to ask you as, as well, despite the fact that I, that I already have a secret copy of it, which is, <laughs> is right there. And yes, despite the fact that I can, I can tell the story now, I'm sure he won't mind it, that I first found out about this book when Joe Duffy stuck his head around the corner of my studio and knocked on the door and said, have you heard about Alex's new book? And I said, no, no, I haven't. He said, it's YA. He said, I don't know a lot about YA, but I really like it. And that's a terrible Joe Duffy impression. And Joe, I'm really sorry if you ever get to, 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 to watch this. Tell me about the new book. Oh, he's so nice. Um, it is a diary of a 16-year-old girl, 15-year-old, about to turn 16, uh, called Ellery Brown. And um, her mother was a writer who passed away um, the previous November. And she gets this diary uh, in uh, on at the end of, of New Year uh, from her aunt. And she suspects it's uh, meant to be therapy for her to, to pour her thoughts into, but she's never known who her father is and her mother died without telling her. So she sets off on an adventure to, to find out who her, her dad is. So um, so that's what it's about. Uh, so it's it's got a lot in it. It's very sweet and it's funny and it deals with grief as well. And it's a detective story story as well so it's a it's a bit of everything but it was uh, it really was it was one of those books that was that was a joy uh, to write from from start to finish so and I hope everyone else likes it and when is that out in the real world September, September. hopefully okay. September as far as I know um, and uh, Ronan I'm right in saying that it's 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 May for Penenka before you start talking about it I have read it I adored it as much as I adored Leonard and Hungry Paul I think for those people who have loved Leonard and Hungry Paul you will find absolutely something that will 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 make your heart sing in in Penenka even though as you said it's a different place and with different characters tell us a little bit about the book as much as you want to oh thanks very much Rick. yeah Penenka is have it here. You can see that. You want to know what Penenka looks like? That's the picture there in front. And um, so, uh, Penenka is. I describe it as as a platonic love story. So it's it's really about Penenka as a character. is a fifty year old man. He's a, he's a he's a grandfather. He lives with his daughter, who he's recently reconciled with, and with her seven year old son, his grandson. And just as he's a man who has made a lot of mistakes in his life and in his relationships, which have really kept him sort of frozen in his life and in a sort of state of exile in his own town. And when he starts to try and get back in touch with his life, things get even more difficult for him. But really what it's about is when we talk about life often, we think of our problems and we think of how we solve our problems, that we solve the things that are difficult in our life. So what I was interested in was what, what do you do in life if, if life is unfixable? If you are broken and your life is broken, what, what, where, where can you take that? Uh, and that's really what Penenka as a book tries to explore. How do, how do broken people find a path in life? Just before we just before we finish tonight, uh, just there's one comment in uh, in the in the Ricochet Book Club in Facebook. It says the thing about Leonard and Hungry Paul for me is that the authenticity comes from the feel that it wasn't written to impress a reader. It was a story laid down to be discovered, to be felt and relished without any expectation. It brought the soul to the surface 
and witnessed the true wonder of humanity. And that's, I think, a perfect way for us to finish off tonight's event. Uh, it has been lovely talking to both of you as part of, of course, One Dublin, One Book. We'll tell you a little bit more about the events that are coming up in just a second. But Alex Barkley, the wonderful Alex Barkley, and the exceptional Ronan and Hessian, you've been brilliant guests tonight. And thanks a million for coming on. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Right, where am I going to go? With? I'm going to remind you very briefly, there are of course a ton of One Dublin One Book events that are happening uh, all across the course of the rest of the month. They are all happening online as well and you can look at them all if you'd like more details. One Dublin One Book dot IE is where you will find all of those details. And that's it for me. I will catch you again on the book show on RTE Radio 1 this coming Sunday uh, at 7 o'clock. Other than that, thanks a million for joining me tonight. I'll see you next time. Good luck. <laughs>